Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. This particular miracle I have known for my whole life. When I was raised in the church as a wee tot, I was taught by that lady right there. I was taught about this miracle for this miracle lends itself really well to children's books. It has that great drama of going up on the roof and digging a hole, and I've seen flannel graphs of it, and I even remember that in one of the classes we took a shoebox and laid it on its side and put little cardboard people inside and on top, cut a little hole. This is a great miracle to teach kids and adults of the power of God and the determination of people to get to Jesus. This is a miracle that is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the main reason of that is that Jesus, for the first time in a setting of this nature, uh, really puts out that he is God incarnate, really puts out that he has the ability to forgive sins. And so this is a very important teaching, and so three of the four gospel writers uh, put it in there to show us who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing, what Jesus is showing of himself. And so the context or the setting of this is a house, and it's a house probably in Capernaum. Jesus had been traveling around. He had traveled all the way down to Jerusalem for probably one of the festivals that you had to be in Jerusalem to do, and he came back up and he has hit a lot of the small villages around the Sea of Galilee, and he has returned to what people are calling kind of his home base of teaching, and that is Capernaum, and Peter has a house there, and so that's maybe where he's hanging out. We do not know the house. It starts by saying, on one of those days, and so that's vague, we do not know what day it is, but it is after the cleansing of the leper and after um, calling the disciples, his ministry is in full swing at this point in the book of Luke. And so he's teaching in a house, and the house is full of Pharisees and teachers of the law, and they were sitting there listening to him, they were probably there to debate him or to prove him wrong. Um, the, the, we see the word Pharisee a lot in the Gospels. They are the same, they are the main opposition to Jesus. Uh, very quickly, the Pharisees were a group that, he ro that rose up during the intertestamental period. If you read through your Old Testament, it ends in Malachi. And then there's probably a page that now says New Testament, and then you have Matthew. That page is over 400 years from the close of Malachi to the angel visiting Zechariah in the temple. Uh, there is 400 years of silence. God sent no prophets. God sent no major teachers. God sent... Um, nobody to give the word of God, people who wrote like the Maccabees, those were the uh, priestly class that existed during the intertestamental period. You can read them if you have a Bible with the Apocrypha. The Maccabees un uninspired scripture is in there. And they talked about how prayers weren't answered, how the Romans were messing with them so bad the, the things just, God was not there. God was absent was the view of those who wrote during the intertestamental period. And the Jewish people looked at this and looked at what had happening and they looked at their history and they looked at how the northern kingdom was taken to Assyria and never came back and the southern kingdom was taken to Babylon for 70 years and came back. And they said to themselves, self, what did we do wrong to cause God to be so mad at us to kick us off the land? Okay? So they studied the Old Testament, and this group of people called Pharisees, Pharisees comes from the root word to separate oneself, so they had separated themselves apart from, 
the populace. They began with some of the lower level priests, Levi's, people who had access to the law. And they said, we need to set up a system where we will be righteousness police so that we will not let the sin of the nation get so bad that God takes us into captivity again. And that was the goal of the Pharisees. They started out being in the synagogues and in the temple and people could come and ask them questions. And over time, generation after generation after generation, they became very self-righteous. They became uh, kind of thinking that they're the only ones who knew the law. And so they had no problem walking down the street and commenting on your behavior, even though you didn't ask them, on how unrighteous you were and that you were going to be the cause of the next captivity that the Jewish people were going to go through. Now, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., and in 132 A.D., the Romans kicked out all the Jews out of Jerusalem, and the Pharisees took all all the writings they could, and they dispersed into the world. And it is during this time that they wrote down all of the oral law. When Jesus is coming against the uh, Pharisees, much of what they're quoting is an oral law that had developed. It wasn't written down. It wasn't a place where you could go and look it up. You had to wait for them to tell you they were wrong. And they began to write it down, and that became the Mishnah and the Gomorrah. And if you go on Amazon and you buy a Talmud... It'll be a very thick book, or an app for your phone, but it'll be a very thick book if you get it in print. And it is the whole Old Testament, plus all the commentary that had developed during the time of the Pharisees, the hundreds of years that the Pharisees were doing this, plus all the oral law they had developed, plus all the application they had developed. So a very thick book, a very difficult book to read because you have the Bible down the middle, then you have all this commentary on the outside in different sections and you don't know whether you read that part and then that part or that part and then that part. It's multiple texts on one page, a very difficult book to study, but Jewish people who want to be experts study it even today. Most of your rabbis that are alive today have studied this book and know how to read it accurately so they can tell the people in their synagogue. All that to say, the Pharisees during Jesus' time had already had a couple hundred years of, of feeling their oats, and so they were sitting there and questioning Jesus and get, you know understanding he has authority, but where does this authority come from? It also says teachers of the law, back then your Xerox machine was a guy with a quill writing, okay? He had the Bible here and a blank scroll over here, and he wrote, he copied it. And there were professional copiers. They are sometimes called scribes in the New Testament. They are sometimes called teachers of the law. They are sometimes called lawyers. Because they had written many times, hundreds of times, the uh, text of the Bible... They had memorized a lot of it just by function of how they did it. They knew every jot and every tittle. And so these people, the experts of of righteousness in the world, were in this house, and it says they had come from every village in Galilee. That means every village around the Sea of Galilee, and Judea, which is in the southern part, and Jerusalem, which is in the way southern part. So they had come from everywhere in the whole Jordan Valley, okay, to see him, to test him, to find out who this guy is. It says in Luke, and uh, let's see, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. It does not say about any specific healing except the paralytic in this passage, but clearly he was doing some healing. He was teaching He was instructing, he was correcting, he was telling people the truth about God, and he was healing people. Now, word of his healing 
came to this group of friends. They are called friends in all the passages. We know that there are four of them. There are four friends and one person who is paralyzed. Now, if you think paralyzed, if you go to the doctor, somebody wheels you to the doctor and says, this person is paralyzed. Paralyzed is not a disease. Paralyzed is a symptom of some other disease. If you think about the various ways you can get paralyzed, today, 99% of the people who are quadriplegic are because of some accident. Famous people have had diving accidents, broken their neck, and are paralyzed. And, you know, quad, we call them quad, quadriplegic. Back then they would say they were paralyzed, cannot move the arms, cannot move the feet. And so we do not know how this person got this way. Back then, there is evidence that bacterial infections could affect the spinal column and make you paralyzed. We believe that there were viruses back then. There are known viruses today that can impact your spinal column and will make you paralyzed. But the most common today, and probably the most common back then, was some kind of accident. Perhaps he was working on the roof and fell off, and therefore he was now paralyzed. And his friends and his family, because he could not move his hands or his feet, would have to feed him, would have to clean him, would have to dress him, would have to make sure the various things were happening that needed to be happening, because paralysis is not listed in the Old Testament as an unclean condition like leprosy, uh, they probably took him to synagogue and they probably brought him to the rabbi and the priest to be blessed and to pray over and things like that. Depending how long this had been going on, they had to do everything for him. Their lives were focused on the care of this man. So they say, aha, here's Jesus. Our friend needs to be healed. We will take our friend to Jesus, and Jesus will heal our friend. And so they put him on some kind of pallet or board. There's four of them, so, you know, probably two on a side. And they pick him up, and they start walking toward the house where Jesus is. But they can't get in. There's too many Pharisees. There are too many common people. There are too many teachers of the law. It is wall-to-wall -wall people. Okay? They say, excuse me. They say, pardon me. They say, paralyzed person coming through. They say everything. They cannot get in. And so one of them says, aha, we'll go up on the roof. We'll go up on the roof and lower the person down before Jesus. Now, there's two types of houses in Jesus' place of Capernaum. There is your common person's house, which was made out of usually brick and mud, and had a thatched roof. They would take palm branches and weave them into a roof. And it wasn't the most watertight, but you're in the desert. How often does it rain? And so they just wanted to be in the shade. 99% of the houses were single story because it's very difficult with your man-made items of brick and stuff to make a multi-story building. They just didn't have the skill at that time. This is, says he has tile. They remove the tile. This is a well-to-do person. This is a person who had the money to bake clay into tile and then use that and have what we would call more Spanish architecture type roofs you can see and they're usually red and have you know laid on top of tile. It is that sort of thing. And so they break the guy's roof, they vandalize the guy's roof, they break the tile, and they make a hole, and they lower the guy down right in front of Jesus. And you can only imagine, as was described in various children's books that I saw, is that as this thing comes down, everybody moves out of the way, and they kind of clear a space for this prone man to go right before in front of Jesus. And so Jesus looks at the man. And Jesus understands that this is now a time or the time to 
shock the Pharisees a little bit, to begin to show who Jesus really is, what Jesus can really do. And so he looks at the person. Now, these people were in the synagogue when he healed the leper. Jesus just touched the leper and he was healed. They may have heard of the, the two uh, younger people that were healed at a distance. Jesus said things and they were healed. And so they were probably expecting, if he was going to heal this person, to say something or to touch him. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. So immediately they clutch their pearls because it's the you know, most devastating, blasphemous thing. And they say blasphemy. And what is blasphemy? Blasphemy is where you say something untrue about God or His Word. And so that can be something that is attributed to Satan. So you can say, and I've heard people say this, God hates everybody. Okay? It's a blasphemous Satan. God does not hate everybody. God is not a God of hate. When you list the attributes of God, hate is not one of them. God is love. God actually does love everybody. And so when you say that God hates everybody, that is blasphemy. It is an untrue attribute that you are putting on God. You can say it backwards and say, God cannot love. Okay, I'll take away an attribute of God. God cannot love. That is blasphemous. So if I put an incorrect attribute on God or I take away an attribute that he has in my talking about him, then these are blasphemous statements. And I can also do it through uh, the way I talk about the Bible. I can say, God never speaks in the Bible. God is perfectly silent in the Bible. That is a blasphemous statement because it is the Word of God, and God speaks everywhere in it, okay? And so that is a wrong statement. And so when He says... I forgive your sins, okay? That's what Jesus was saying in the leaving the pronoun, pronoun out. He says, I forgive. They know in their mind only God can forgive sins, and this non-God is taking an attribute of God and putting it on himself. They're saying a man is taking an attribute of God and putting it on himself that's why it's blasphemy. That's why they are saying you have blasphemed. And they question and they mumble amongst themselves and all this kind of stuff. Now when Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, the tense of that is all of them. He was saying to this person, now it's also unclear whether he's saying it to all five or to just the person laying down. Uh, he does mention, I have seen you all's faith, okay? He has seen the faith of the five, okay? The four carriers and the one on the bench. We're not sure at this point whether he has forgiven just the person laying down or all five of them. But he is saying, and the way he's saying it is, all of your sins are forgiven. We would say from the cross... All of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. This person is as saved as he can be because he is righteous before God because all of his sins, past, present, and future, is forgiven. And they say, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. And when we look at what Jesus says next, he says, what is easier to say? Uh, let's see. And the scribes of Pharisee, what is it? Okay, we're going to sin. Jesus breathed their thoughts. And he said, why do you question your hearts? What is easier to say in 23rd, in 23? This is a kind of Aramaic idiom. We have found this in other writings. He's not saying, what is easier for your mouth to form the words of? Okay? He is saying, of these two statements... Which is easier to believe? Jesus has a paralyzed man. He, the two statements he's comparing is, I forgive all your sins, or get up and walk. He says, which is easier to believe that he can do? 
And of course, it, for Jesus, it's like, ah, you know, neither one. Don't even break a sweat, okay? Easy for both. For the Pharisees, both are impossible. And so Jesus is saying, kind of between the lines, that you have God standing right before you, God incarnate, and you are so caught up in your rules and your laws and your legalistic behavior and your, you know, minute bothering people with the stuff they do, the, that you miss the fact that God is right in front of you. So Jesus speaking about what he can truly do, because he can do both. He can forgive sins and he can heal a paralytic. Okay? Both are equal in his ability to do. The Pharisees say you can't do either of them. And so Jesus says, because you know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. And what he is doing when he says your sins are forgiven is that Jesus is taking the future work of the cross and bringing it to this person. Okay? When we look at the Bible and we look at people like Abraham, Abraham lived a long time ago. Okay? But in Hebrews we find Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. How we think it works is that God was able to reach forward and take the work of the cross and go way back to Abraham and apply it to him because he had faith. Of course, nobody is really saved on paper in the, in the accounting of God until Christ says it is finished. Okay? But in, in God's accounting, he is applying a future redemptive work to people in the past. And that seems to be what Jesus is doing here. We know for a fact that Jesus died on the cross and that his blood does bring forgiveness of sins. And so even if this person had to wait for a couple years for Jesus to die on the cross... That's fine. Jesus is declaring for all eternity this person is forgiven. And he says, because the son, you know the Son of Man has authority to uh, forgive sins on earth, which Jesus did, which is what Jesus did on the cross. On the cross, Jesus died for your sins. Jesus provided forgiveness for your sins on earth. Okay? Your sins weren't forgiven when Jesus made it to heaven. When Jesus said, it is finished and breathed his last, boom, your forgiveness was sealed. Now, you didn't receive it until you knew about it 2,000 years later, but that is when the work happened and that is what is applied to our lives when we believe and accept Jesus is that, that, work, that single work on the cross. There's not multiple redemptive works. There's not multiple works of forgiveness. That one saved everybody in the Old Testament, saved everybody in the New Testament that believed, and saved everybody who lives today and believed. That one work on the cross. And so he says, because you'll know that I have authority to do this, he then says the other phrase, pick up your mat and go home, and the guy pops up. Now the guy has been um, paralyzed, and he stands right up, and the thing that we have to note, and it's kind of, I mean, we understand this, but there's no recovery. There's no physical therapy. There's no, uh, well, go home and rest for six weeks because you've had, a, you've had a shock to your system. This person is fully, completely, absolutely, totally, in every possible way, and instantly healed whatever disease, spinal cord in injury, bacteria, virus, whatever disease caused the paralysis, it is fixed. It is fully repaired. Today, we have a real t problem in our medical um, establishment fixing spinal cord in injuries. 
They can do very minor, very small things. But if you break your spinal cord so that you cannot walk, the best they can do now is they put robotic thingies on your leg so you can get a fake spinal cord. You, you, you know, and they're doing it that way because they can't fix the inside. Jesus can fix the inside. Whatever is going on in you that we can't see, that the medical industry is baffled by, Jesus can and does fix. Okay? And so this person is completely and totally healed. He's able to stand up and pick up his board that he was lying on and go home. And I'm sure that as soon as this happened, the crowd that was wall to wall cleared because it says, uh, and immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he'd been lying on and went home glorifying God. He now knows he had been in the presence of God. He glorifies God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe. In the Greek, it is fear. They were scared to death about this guy who can do this sort of thing. Because if he can do that, think of what he can do to me. In a, in a negative, you know, he can take away somebody's paralysis. He can put it on me. And people have written commentaries on this that that is what the, the fear is, that we don't know the nature of God at this point. We don't know, is Jesus a nice guy? Is Jesus kind? Is Jesus loving? They don't know that yet. And so you have this loose cannon who can heal leper, take leprosy away there, take paralysis away here. If there's somebody he doesn't like, can they put it on him? Can they make him leprous? Can they make him paralyzed? Paraly paralyzed? There's the word. And so there's fear because we don't know what this power is that is before us. And it, they, it goes throughout the, the Galilee area, this teaching of this amazing healing. And my guess is the forgiveness of sins because when Jesus starts forgiving sins... That's really going to get people thinking and wondering who he is. And they said, we have seen extraordinary things today. What we might say today is, our mind has been blown, is that we can't figure out what we've seen. And that is the image that Jesus is putting on these people to get them even questioning their view of God because God is different than they have been taught for hundreds of years by the Pharisees. Jesus is the only way we can get our sins forgiven on earth. And our ultimate healing, which comes in heaven, is only available through the work of Christ. God does heal us today, here and there as he wills. But 100% of us, all of us, will be healed 100%. When Jesus Christ finally returns and we get the glorified body, this is who Jesus is and it kind of, at least in the book of Matthew, it kind of goes downhill from here with his relationship with the Pharisees because they don't like what he has said. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we just praise your name that you are all powerful. There is nothing that can stump you. There is nothing you cannot do. And Lord, I ask that we would be people of prayer, that we would bring these big things before you, knowing that you will always answer to your glory and to our sanctification. Lord, we praise you for all of these things and ask your blessing upon the meal to follow. We ask all this in the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen.